Welcome back to Corium. I'm Brian Gaberti, and today we're joined by one of our stellar senior residents, Dr. Stephanie Biondi. Thanks for being on the podcast, Steph. Thanks for having me. Now, for the listeners, what prompted this podcast was an impactful morning report you gave recently on a topic that is rare and requires a keen history and exam to diagnose, along with some other advanced tests, and that is nitrous oxide toxicity. So can you set the stage for us with a faux case to help illustrate how these patients may present? Sure. So we're going to be discussing the pathophysiology of nitrous oxide toxicity via a patient case today. Our patient's a 21-year-old male with no past medical history, presenting with one month of progressively worsening numbness, tingling, and pins and needles sensation, which began in his toes and gradually spread upward to his hips. He also had numbness and tingling in both hands from his fingertips to his wrists bilaterally, which began a week ago. For the past two weeks, He has noticed symmetric bilateral lower extremity weakness, which began distally at the feet and has slowly progressed up to the hip level. He came in today because his weakness has progressed to the point that he can't walk. He is denying bowel or bladder incontinence or retention, a history of IV drug use, a history of malignancy, fevers, weight loss, falls, or trauma. Initially, he denied drug use, but then when asked specifically about whippets, he did endorse using 40 to 60 canisters of whippets every weekend for the past three months. Okay, so Steph, let's take a quick detour and talk about what whippets are. And for all the listeners born before 1990, give us a little bit of history. Let us know what they are traditionally used for and how they work. So whippets is the modern slang term for nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide, or N2O, is a colorless, odorless, inhaled anesthetic that works mainly by antagonizing NMDA, similar to ketamine. It creates a sensation of euphoria, anxiolysis, and intoxication. When nitrous oxide was first synthesized in 1772 by English chemist Joseph Priestley, he had a noble cause, to help people giving birth and people undergoing surgeries or dental procedures to experience less pain. And nitrous oxide is actually still used for these purposes today and has even had a resurgence in use by laboring moms recently. However, almost immediately after Dr. Priestley synthesized nitrous oxide, people realized that they loved that euphoria of NMDA antagonism and began using it recreationally even as early as 1799. It became majorly popular in the 1970s to 1990s as a club drug, then had a resurgence during COVID lockdowns that has persisted today. It's theorized that the resurgence began because the canisters are legal and easily accessible even during lockdowns, since they're sold at grocery stores and online as a whipped cream foaming agent. When lockdowns were lifted, people brought it to clubs and parties, and the rest is history. Yes, and as somebody who grew up in the 80s, I do remember hearing about whippets. And it's interesting to hear that their use has increased recently. Now, this is an important point that I took away from your presentation that there are some dangerous misconceptions about nitrous oxide. So let's take a second to review how the substance is viewed by the general public. Yeah, so the reputation of nitrous oxide on social media is actually quite misleading. Many say that whippets are a legal high which doesn't cause long-term health consequences. Young professionals also love that whippets supposedly allow you to have a sensation similar to alcohol intoxication, yet you awaken with no hangover. So it's become very popular amongst young professionals who want to party and then go to work the next morning with no ill effects. Most are unaware that there can be lasting or even permanent health problems as a result of frequent nitrous oxide use. And Steph, what are the health consequences? And as you talk about how patients may present, what are some important components of your neuro exam when you evaluate someone with potential nitrous oxide toxicity or more broadly, someone with a similar chief complaint as our fabricated case? Yes. So uh, on exam, you can expect symmetrically decreased strength and sensation in a stocking and glove pattern. Cranial nerve exam and mental status exam are typically normal. You may notice an upgoing Babinski reflex, increased tone, and slight hyperreflexia to the lower extremities. It's very important to also test proprioception in patients with bilateral lower extremity weakness to help differentiate this patient's condition from other neurologic disorders. Patients with nitrous oxide toxicity often have a positive Romberg, dysmetria with finger to nose, or dysmetria with heel to shin. Perfect. And now on to the meat and potatoes of this episode, the differential diagnosis. Walk us through the pathophysiology that you're considering when you perform your exam. So when patients have neurologic complaints, I like to first decide whether to quote unquote activate stroke or spinal emergency, which are specific protocols at our hospital for acute onset neurosymptoms. This faux patient symptoms were not acute, so we won't go down those pathways. Next, I like to try and think like a neurologist and localize the lesion. 
So given the symmetric leg weakness and numbness and the sensory level, that makes this more likely a spinal cord pathology or neuropathy rather than a brain pathology. Brain lesions typically cause hemiparesis in conditions like stroke or scattered areas of weakness in conditions like MS. Neuropathies and spinal cord pathology typically cause symmetric weakness, but the spinal cord has many different tracts of neurons and different pathologies affect different tracts. Nice stuff. And I'm glad that you brought up this point. It's always important to first assess acuity and ask ourselves, should this be activated as a stroke code or a spinal cord emergency? Time is brain and time is cord. If not, then we could start thinking about potential spinal cord lesions. So let's get even more granular and talk about the different tracks. And there's going to be a lot to absorb here. So refer to the table in our show notes for a refresher. Sure. The lateral corticospinal tract contains upper motor neuron lesions. So conditions that affect this tract are going to cause spastic paralysis or spastic weakness with increased tone, increased reflexes, upgoing plantars, and clonus on exam. Examples of conditions that could cause damage to upper motor neurons in the spine include trauma to the spinal cord, anterior spinal artery stroke, transverse myelitis, subacute combined degeneration, or spinal cord compression caused by epidural abscesses, tumors, or degenerative spinal stenosis. We can further narrow this differential by chronicity. Spinal stroke or trauma would be very acute. Spinal stenosis would be very chronic, while the remaining conditions like mass effect on the spine, subacute combined degeneration, or transverse myelitis could be more subacute. In contrast, lower motor neuron lesions cause decreased tone, decreased reflexes, downgoing plantars, atrophy and wasting, and muscle fasciculation on exam. The anterior horn of the spinal cord, the nerve roots, peripheral motor nerves, and the neuromuscular junction make up the lower motor neuron pathway, damage to which will cause flaccid paralysis or flaccid paresis. Examples of condition that affect the anterior horn of the spinal cord include polio or ALS. Conditions that affect nerve roots or peripheral motor nerves include cauda equina, tabes dorsalis, Guillain-Barre slash AIDP. And the many different types of neuropathies, including alcohol, HIV, diabetic, copper deficiency, vitamin E deficiency, and folate deficiency-related neuropathies. Neuromuscular junction lesions are caused by botulism, myasthenia gravis, or Lambert-Eaton myasthenia. To further narrow your differential when thinking of a lower motor neuron lesion, we could look at the patterns of weakness caused by these lesions. Neuropathies typically cause symmetric, distal greater than proximal weakness, and are often associated with stocking and glove pattern sensory deficits. Neuromuscular junction problems like myasthenias or botulism usually cause oculobulbar weakness and proximal greater than distal muscle weakness. Tabes dorsalis usually presents with ataxia prior to weakness, and cauda equina is typically acute onset bilateral leg weakness and numbness, especially saddle numbness with bowel and bladder dysfunction. So our faux patient seems to have some features of both upper and lower motor neuron symptoms. He has distal greater than proximal muscle weakness with stocking glove pattern sensory changes typical of lower motor neuron lesions. However, he also had hyperreflexia and upgoing plantars typical of upper motor neuron lesions. Many of these diseases actually affect multiple areas of the nervous system. For instance, tabes dorsalis affects nerve roots, which are lower motor neurons, the corticospinal tract, which are upper, as well as the dorsal columns, which control proprioception. Subacute combined degeneration affects the peripheral motor nerves, which are lower, the lateral corticospinal tract, which are upper, and the dorsal columns. And finally, ALS also affects both upper and lower motor neurons in the spine. So at this point in the workup of our faux patient, given their mixed picture on exam, I was definitely worried about conditions like tabes dorsalis and subacute combined degeneration that can cause proprioception deficits, but I also didn't want to rule out subacute conditions that fit the timeline and pattern of weakness, like transverse myelitis or neuropathy. Now, that's a great summary of how we try to pinpoint the lesion and what is on our differential given each finding. Now that we've done the exam, we can extend our workup with labs. What labs are you getting and what do you pay particular attention to in the results? In terms of blood work, I think it's important to get basic labs, especially a CBC and coags, to make sure it's safe to potentially do a lumbar puncture. The CBC is also important because if you see evidence of a megaloblastic anemia with elevated MCV and hypersegmented neutrophils, that could help hint toward a diagnosis of subacute combined degeneration from B12 deficiency. Getting HIV and syphilis labs could also help to rule out an HIV-related neuropathy or tabes dorsalis. 
Finally, if you're an especially motivated diagnostician, you could send out some slower labs that may not come back during the ED visit, but could help out your inpatient colleagues. These include copper levels, B12 levels, A1C, and folate levels, which will help to evaluate for subacute combined degeneration or neuropathies. So Steph, we can't finish talking about what we're sending off the lab without talking about a lumbar puncture. So tell us about this procedure and what you're looking for in the results. A lumbar puncture can help us to assess for some of the differentials like Guillain-Barre, MS, and transverse myelitis. With the lumbar puncture, you could look for albuminocytological dissociation, which is an elevated CSF protein level in the absence of CSF leukocytosis. This is a feature of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Additionally, one can send an oligoclonal band level from the CSF. If this is negative, MS or transverse myelitis become less likely. But in order to tackle the remaining differentials, we have to obtain an MRI of the total spine. Okay, and this is going to be one of the critical tests. So what would you expect to see on the MRI in a patient with nitrous oxide toxicity? So there is actually a pathognomonic finding on MRI for patients with nitrous oxide toxicity, And what that finding is, is a symmetric high-intensity signal in the dorsal columns known as the inverted V sign or rabbit ear sign, and this indicates subacute combined degeneration. This sign is seen in the T2-weighted axial images. Whenever you see hyper-intense signals in the spine on T2, that usually means demyelination has taken place. The dorsal columns are dorsal anatomically, meaning that they'll appear toward the bottom of the screen on your axial cut MRI. So the demyelination, which usually is in the thoracic spine, will appear in the shape of an upside-down V. Okay, and so with that, we've honed in on the diagnosis of subacute combined degeneration. Now let's dedicate some time to this condition and its pathophysiology. Correct. So subacute combined degeneration is all in the name. It's a subacute degeneration of myelin in the dorsal columns and the lateral corticospinal tract. So it's like a combination of those two tracts. This results in both upper motor neuron pattern weakness and ataxia and diminished proprioception. Subacute combined degeneration also eventually causes demyelination of peripheral motor nerves and peripheral sensory nerves, so it can cause some lower motor neuron symptoms as well, with stocking and glove pattern numbness and tingling like our faux patient. So it could explain all of his symptoms. Subacute combined degeneration is caused by B12 deficiency. But Steph, help us connect the dots here. How could a young person with a normal diet have B12 deficiency? When we think of B12 deficiency, what normally comes to mind is things like pernicious anemia, veganism, or Crohn's disease, or another condition damaging the terminal ileum. But if the patient doesn't have any of those things, you may think of whippets, because nitrous oxide can actually cause a functional B12 deficiency. Certainly. And this is another point in emergency medicine where it's so important to get an accurate history. And it's actually an art to kind of tease out these clues in our patient's history. So let's take it a step further and talk about the how behind all of this. Sure. So nitrous oxide, aka N2O, oxidizes a cobalt moiety on vitamin B12, rendering it functionally useless, even if you are consuming and absorbing adequate B12. When B12 is oxidized by nitrous oxide, it cannot perform its key biochemical roles. One of its roles is to activate methionine synthase. Without active methionine synthase, you can't convert folate into tetrahydrofolate, which is needed to produce DNA. So that's why megaloblastic anemia can occur with nitrous oxide-associated subacute combined degeneration. Additionally, methionine synthase is needed to convert homocysteine to methionine. And methionine is critical to maintaining myelin integrity. So that's why demyelination of the dorsal columns and peripheral motor and sensory nerves occurs with nitrous oxide-induced subacute combined degeneration. B12 levels can be completely normal in the setting of a functional deficiency caused by nitrous oxide. So to confirm this diagnosis of subacute combined degeneration induced by whippets, you have to send a methylmalonic acid and homocysteine level. These should be elevated because these compounds are ordinarily metabolized with the assistance of B12. Perfect. And Steph, you were the first person on the show to ever use the word moiety. And as a chemistry major, I sincerely thank you for using that term. Let's move on to treatment for this. Yeah, well, had to make our toxicology colleagues proud. Um, So there's actually no standardized treatment regimen for nitrous oxide-induced subacute combined degeneration. However, many neurologists agree that injecting B12 daily or every other day until symptoms begin to improve is usually helpful. After the symptoms begin to remit, the frequency of injections is usually spaced out to weekly. Um, And they usually use injections of 1,000 micrograms of vitamin B12 intramuscularly. 
In order to recover, the most critical aspect would be to abstain from further Whippet's use so that you don't inactivate the administered vitamin B12. People can slowly regain neurologic function after nitrous oxide-induced subacute combined degeneration, but remyelination doesn't happen overnight and it can be a long road. Recovery is slow and often incomplete. About 80% of nitrous oxide-induced subacute combined degeneration patients have some improvement after a year of B12 treatments, but unfortunately, only 10 to 20% make a total recovery back to their baseline. Another important aspect to think about is that the likelihood of developing subacute combined degeneration increases with the number of nitrous oxide whipped cream canisters utilized. About 3.4% of Whippets users overall develop subacute combined degeneration, but 8.5% of those who use greater than 100 canisters per session go on to develop subacute combined degeneration. And people with pre-existing B12 deficiency are at higher risk of subacute combined degeneration symptoms, even with low amounts of usage. Thank you. And I know that beyond the medicine, there's a message here. So Steph, wrap us up with some closing remarks. I think it's important to bring attention to nitrous oxide use among ED providers because recreational use is becoming more and more prolific amongst young people. And we need to be screening for this in patients with subacute strength, sensation, or proprioceptive deficits so that we catch and treat more cases of nitrous oxide induced subacute combined degeneration. It's more treatable the earlier it's caught. It's also important to ask directly about whippets in these patients with unexplained neurosymptoms because these patients often don't consider nitrous oxide to be a hard drug, or they think that it's safe to use so they don't mention it. We can also educate these patients about the long-term health consequences that they may be unaware of to try and prevent more cases of subacute combined degeneration for cropping up in the future. Dr. Biondi, thanks for being on the podcast and helping us continue to craft our neuro exam and outlining an approach to diagnosing this condition while encouraging us to consider nitrous oxide toxicity on our differential when patients with similar complaints present to our EDs. Yeah, thanks for having me. 